Well, good morning and welcome to City Hall. We're going to get started with the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Randy Faulkner is the pastor at Metropolitan Baptist Church here in Oklahoma City, and he's going to lead us in the uh, invocation. Afterwards, I'll ask Councilman Griner if he'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But would everyone please stand? Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you through your Holy Son and by your Holy Spirit. It's our prayer that your holy will will be done in this city today. We're glad that we can be quiet for a moment, pray for the peace and prosperity of our city. We want to be careful to give you thanks. We are so grateful for food and shelter, good health, protection. We thank you for our families. We pray for those today who are cold and homeless and hungry, and we pray that you will bless those agencies and ministries that are serving the poor. We pray for your protection and guidance for our public safety officers. Please keep them in your care. We pray for our schools, for our teachers, our children. We pray for those who are charged with planning for the future of our city. And we are so grateful, Father, for the progress that has been made in recent years we pray for continued wisdom for all the big decisions that are before this council. We pray for your blessings on this meeting. Bless our mayor, our city council, our staff. And as your word guides us, Lord, we pray that you will help us to trust in you with all our hearts and not lean on our own understanding, but to acknowledge you in all our ways. And we thank you for the promise that you will make our paths straight. In your holy name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, it may have slipped past everybody, but we are right smack dab in the middle of Oklahoma Heritage Week, and Louise Painter is here. We have a proclamation we're going to put together. Louise, come on up, and I'll ask the clerk to read the proclamation as Louise and I get settled down here. Whereas the signing of the Statehood Proclamation on November 16, 1907, was the most significant action in the history of the state of Oklahoma, whereas the week of November 16 through 22 has been declared Oklahoma Heritage Week in the state of Oklahoma, whereas all Oklahomans should pause during this time and reflect on our Oklahoma heritage as well as our national heritage. Oklahoma City has the obligation and privilege to play an important role in the observance of this great week. Now therefore, Mick Cornett, the mayor of the city of Oklahoma City, does hereby declare the week of November 16 through 22, 2014 as Oklahoma Heritage Week in Oklahoma City, and he encourages all citizens, families, clubs, churches, businesses, organizations, and schools in Oklahoma City to give personal attention to all special Statehood Day observances, to fly the Oklahoma State flag and the national colors, and to participate in and sponsor programs, projects, and activities emphasizing the heritage of this great state. Let's show our appreciation to the state of Oklahoma and to Heritage Week. and. To Louise, and uh, you know, it might just be a good time if you have children in the home just to talk to them about Oklahoma's history and uh, the fact that we're a fairly new state. And but we celebrate November 16th, which was two days ago, as uh, as uh, Heritage Week because that's when the proclamation. That's when we officially became a state when uh, President Roosevelt signed the papers. Anything else we can do? Just remember that it's our birthday, and especially celebrate the people of Oklahoma who have caused us to be here and enjoy this great state that we have, and especially here in Oklahoma City, stop a little bit and think about the people who are doing all the hard work to bring you 
water, electricity, the guys who go out in the middle of the night when your electricity is off, and give thanks to them. This is all part of what makes this a great state. And where else in the country can you enjoy the snowstorm we had yesterday and all the slipping and sliding? And then this morning, roads are all clear, nice. So anyway, it's a great state to live in. And just tell everybody, your neighbors, your friends, in other parts of the country, what a great place Oklahoma is. Thank you. Louise, our best cheerleader. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Every month, the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City helps us honor one teacher in the entire city as our Teacher of the Month, and uh, Betty Shadone is here. Betty, come on up. Betty is a uh, pre-K instructor at Monroe Elementary School, and can you imagine, out of all of the teachers, um, to have been selected as, as the, the Special Teacher of the Month? Betty, thank you so much. We have a resolution. I'll ask the clerk to read it as we get settled. Whereas Betty Shadone has been named Teacher of the Month by the Foundation for Oklahoma City Public Schools and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City for November 2014. Whereas Betty Shadone teaches pre-kindergarten for special needs students at Monroe Elementary School. Whereas Betty Shadone was honored as the Monroe Elementary School 2013-14 Building Teacher of the Year. Whereas Betty Shadone was honored as a finalist for the 2014-15 Oklahoma City Public Schools District Teacher of the Year. And whereas Betty Shadone is a National Board Certified Teacher and is an education leader who seeks to inspire, support, and encourage other teachers. Whereas Betty Shadone conducts herself as a consummate professional and dedicates herself to the service of her students. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby recognize and commend Betty Shadone on her selection as November 2014 Teacher of the Month by the Foundation for Oklahoma City Public Schools and the Rotary Club of Oklahoma City. Let's give Betty a big round of applause. For and, uh, technically, we have to vote on this. I'll look for a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Betty, they're all green, all, all green lights. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, uh, and I got to speak uh, with Betty for a few minutes today, and, and she really has a calling. She teaches uh, pre-K kids with special needs. And, and I can't imagine the, the, the challenges that might exert themselves on a daily basis. I am really honored to be here. Um, Oklahoma City schools have really terrific teachers. My three kids went through the, the public school system, and they all have advanced degrees. My son is going to be celebrating his graduation with his doctorate in December from University of Tulsa. They all had great Oklahoma City teachers. Uh, this week, my class is learning about the letter O, and Oklahoma is definitely <laughs> one of our words we're going to be going over. My kids will learn that they live in Oklahoma. <laughs> Thank great. you. Big round of applause for that. That's terrific. And um, on a somewhat somber note, we are losing one of our longest friends down at City Hall. Uh, Donna Morris has been working with the library system and running the uh, library system for a long, long time. Donna, why don't you come up? And I think we have several members from your board. If you all would come up and, and surround her here, we'll have the resolution. And I know there's some library employees here too. So come on up and uh, let's honor Donna Morris, who is winding up 45 years 45 years with the Oklahoma City Metropolitan um, Library System and the 13 years as Executive Director. We have a resolution. I'll ask the clerk to read it. Whereas the Metropolitan Library System's Donna Morris has provided exemplary service to the residents of Oklahoma City during her 45-year tenure and in her 13-year capacity as Executive Director. Whereas Mrs. Morris has been a strong advocate for libraries across Oklahoma and the nation. She has served as a president of the Oklahoma Library Association, ALA counselor, legislative chair, and in many other OLA capacities, as well as being an active member of the American Library Association and the Public Library Association. Whereas Mrs. Morris, a visionary and respected leader in the community, has been a member of the Downtown Rotary Club, Leadership OKC, the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber of Commerce, and the Oklahoma State Chamber. 
Whereas Mrs. Morris has been the leading force in the development of two new libraries in Oklahoma City, the Patience S. Ladding Northwest Library at 5600 Northwest 122nd Street, which is the first LEED certified public library built in Oklahoma, and the El Monte Library at 2914 Southwest 59th Street, as well as playing a pivotal role in the construction and grand opening of the Ronald J. Norick Downtown Library in 2004. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Mayor and Council of the City of Oklahoma City that they do hereby express sincere appreciation and gratitude to Donna Morris for her dedicated service to the Metropolitan Library System and wish her all the best for a well-deserved retirement. Let's show our appreciation to Donna. This is for you. And uh, my goodness. Um, I'm going to hand you the microphone just because I, I want to hear thoughts of, uh, of a 45-year career in our library system. But uh, you know, you don't have to look very far to see the see the results of your work. Uh, you know, we have so many chal uh, challenging challenges out there and promising young people, and of course, beautiful building right across the street. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks to the City Council um, for this honor. I wanted to build on what you said about uh, schools. I went to Arthur Elementary. Roosevelt Junior High and graduated from U.S. Grant. So Oklahoma City uh, Public Schools kind of helped me on the path. I really want to commend the city for the partnership that we've had with the library system over the, the time that I've been director. Many of the city council people and the mayor have really been helpful. Jim Couch, I'm sure he's probably glad I'm gone because I've bugged him <laughs> quite a bit uh, to get some things done. But it's been a great partnership. We've, we've, the library's mentioned in here as well as renovating two of our libraries. Southern Oaks and Ralph Ellison, and we have two more projects in the works to renovate Belle Isle and Capitol Hill. And so we're excited about that. You know, they say that great communities have great libraries, and I would say that you all should be commended for that because I think we have a great community, and part of it is a great library system. Yeah, we do have a great library system. And, and I want to, this, uh, this, uh, this, this support group here, uh, you know, all got up when, when we said we want to do something for Donna, they were here. So. Don, I hope you feel the love in the room, and we really appreciate and have valued your service, and we hope you won't be too much of a stranger down here at City Hall and in the libraries. Maybe a little. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. You bet. But, thank you. Uh -huh. Mayor, if I may, just make a comment from both perspectives, uh, being on the City Council as well as being a member of the, uh, the Board uh, of Trustees for the Metropolitan Library System. Donna's leadership really uh, was evident throughout all those years that I was involved with the library system. And uh, anyone who takes on an organization as large as the Metropolitan Library System really has a lot of issues to deal with, and, and she did just a tremendous job. Um, she has, as we've mentioned, some great uh, uh, particular projects that have been accomplished under her tenure. The, uh, and we go from some extremes from the downtown library, which is just tremendous, to the Al Monte Library, which is almost uh, a storefront type library. But all of those libraries really do uh, have a tremendous impact on so many people's lives. They really change the courses of many people's lives. To be able to have access to the books and other learning materials is so important. And with the Al Monte Library, uh, for example, just opening that up brought in hundreds of new members to the library system and especially the children and especially those who uh, uh, may not be as well acquainted with our language here to be able to gain additional understanding through the library is so important and it helps them, uh, you know, have success in schools and, and later in their lives as well as adults to uh, continue that learning process. So the libraries are truly important. We've got to protect them, support them, and Donna was so critical in the continued growth with the Metropolitan Library. So thank you, Donna. Mayor, if I could just add my congratulations. Donna, thank you so much for your service. I so appreciate it. We had the privilege of working closely together on a couple of the projects uh, downtown, particularly the Rotary Leaping Waters Fountain that I, to this day, see children 
playing in that fountain. It's been a real gift to downtown Oklahoma City. And then the placement of our Rotary Buffalo, Harris, right outside the library. And it's also been a joy. But I hope you enjoy these next years. Um, we've just appreciated working with you so very much. And we do need to pass a resolution honoring Donna that uh, the clerk Second. read. All right, cast your votes. And it passed unanimously. Thank you, Donna. <laughs> All right, we're on the council agenda on item three, C, D, and E, a series of appointments. I'll look for a motion. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item three F is a resolution that would approve travel expenses for me to attend the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting in Washington, D.C. in January. All right, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item four is a journal of council proceedings. 4A is to receive the journal for November 4th, and 4B is to approve the journal for October 21st. All right, comments or questions on the journal? All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And item five is your request for uncontested continuances. Mayor, a couple this morning, starting on page 16, item 9C2, 9C2 on page 16, CE891, the applicant is requesting that this item be deferred until the December 2nd council meeting. And then moving to page 18, under item 9H1, item B, 4220 North Westminster. Request that that be stricken, we need to re-notify. And item F, 4701 Northwest 19th Street. Request that that be stricken, we need to re-notify. And then on to page 19, under item 9J1, A, 5200 Bodine Drive. Request that that be stricken, the owner secured. Item E, 4128 Jones Boulevard, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item N, 113 Southeast 19th Street, we ask that that be stricken. There's a new owner. Item O, 2301 Northwest 19th Street, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. Item P, 1926 Northwest 22nd Street, we ask that that be stricken. The owner has secured. And finally, item V. 1309 Northwest 82nd Street. We ask that that be stricken. Again, the owner has secured. All right, any other requests for uncontested continuances? All right, we're on to item six. It's revocable permits. Our first is item 6A. It's to hold the Holiday River Parade at the Oklahoma River and Regatta Park. Mike McAuliffe is here. Mike, you want to come up and tell us uh, more about this annual event? Good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, it's a, a tough assignment to follow the letter O and 45 years of service, but I'll <laughs> give it a try. The, uh, this is the 10th anniversary of the uh, River Parade. It was started in 2004. We skipped a year in 2010 because of the construction on the riverfront, but uh, it was started in 2004 for primarily the reason is we didn't have a river before 2004. <laughs> and so the first River Parade officially opened the river, the MAPS project. And uh, since then, um, we have, uh, after we pay our expenses from the River Parade each year, we take the funds left over and we put it into a fund at the Oklahoma City Community Foundation called the Oklahoma River Foundation Fund. And I'm proud to report that after doing this event for nine years now, this will be our 10th, of course, um, that that fund now has over $800,000 in wow. it there. And the, the uh, proceeds from that fund, once we hit the million dollar mark, I was hoping we'd reach it by now, because I told Norick I'd do 10 years. And so anyway, <laughs> uh, I, I was hoping we'd reach the million mark by now. But once that does reach a million dollars, the interest from those funds will go to help support other projects, matching funds, improvements on the river and the trails also. So we're excited about what we've accomplished about uh, putting on a free family holiday event. I do, Mayor, I'd like to uh, mention the sponsors that have been with us for the major sponsors since we started it, and to recognize them, Bank First, the Chickasaw Nation, the City of Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City Riverfront Redevelopment Authority, and the EL and Thelma Gaylord Foundation. In addition, this year we're adding uh, Air Comfort Solutions as our title sponsor, so we appreciate Air Comfort Solutions coming on board to help us with this, again, a great free family event. Finally, I'll close by saying uh, we're honored to have our former mayor, Andy Coates as our Grand Marshal this year, and, and he had a tough four years as mayor, uh, Mayor Cornette, as you know, during those times, but the one thing that Andy Coates did do was he started the Riverfront Authority, Pete, as, as you'll recall, which is now the Oklahoma City R Riverfront Redevelopment Authority. So we're uh, excited to have uh, former Mayor Coates and his family join us Friday, 
December, or December, November 28th uh, on the Oklahoma River. It starts at 6 o'clock p.m. And again, I appreciate the support of the city, uh, the council, uh, city manager Couch, and all have given us to put this on for 10 years. Thank you. You bet, Mike. Thank you. And uh, we have a motion and a second. I cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. All right, item 6B is a revocable right-of-way use permit from DG, DG Productions, USA Track and Field Sanction, to hold the OKC Turkey Tracks. And it looks like, uh, it's, is it Carrie? Rolston. Rolston. Yes. And you are? Don Garrett, DG Productions, 14420 South Meridian. Great to have both of you here. Tell us more about the, the uh, turkey tracks. Uh, this is the 5K run and a one-mile fun run that we do. This is our fourth annual. We do every year on Thanksgiving morning, 9 o'clock. We burn calories before we go stuff ourselves. <laughs> and uh, part of, part of the uh, purpose is to raise funds and toys for the Toys for Tots each year. We work with the U.S. Marine Corps. And they bring a truck, and we try to fill the truck with toys. So, and we've been very successful in the past. Well, expect about 2,000 people. And they'll be running uh, two different links, you were saying? Yes, what? yes. At uh, uh, 8.30, there's a one-mile fun run, uh, which is an untimed event, which anyone, I hope, hopefully can participate. Mm -hmm. And uh, at 9 o'clock, a 5K run, which okay. is... Okay. Can people sign up on that day? Or they, they can. They can sign up on that day, and they can sign up now at uh, www.dgroadracing.com. Uh, okay. And uh, 9 o'clock, where will they start? Where will, where will that run? It'll start uh, right next to the post office and go north there and do a loop and come back to the post office. Okay. Well, thank you all heart. very much. We appreciate this. And I hope a lot of people will participate. Great strategy to burn some calories before you have <laughs> pecan pie. <laughs> anyway, I would move approval. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Thank, thank you. you all. And item 6B2 is a request from Stockyard City Main Street to host the Cowboy Christmas Parade, November 29th, down on Exchange Avenue. And you must be Emily Allen. I am. Yeah. Good morning. Nice to see you, Emily. Can you nice tell us more about you. this event? Yes, we've held it for at least over 50 years. No one really knows quite when it started, but it's <laughs> been a long time. So we hope to do that again this year. It'll be the same thing. We start off with our Longhorns that everyone loves. That's our signature thing with the parade. and. Afterwards, we'll have a, uh, pictures and presents with Santa in the Rodeo Opry for the children. It's completely free. Everything's free unless they want to buy hot chocolate. And it's a fun thing that we moved up to November 29th. We usually have it the first weekend of December, but we're avoiding bedlam and bad weather. So hopefully the holiday weekend will work out better for us. But. All right. And that's a Saturday? Yes. Okay. It'll be Saturday so morning at 10 a.m. A week from Saturday mm -hmm. uh, down in Stockyards. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, and we'll uh, get a motion a second and see if we can't get this one passed as well. Second. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Thank you, Emily. All right, we'll recess the council meeting, convene as the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority. There are four items. All right. Comments or questions about the MFA? Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Adjourn the OCMFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, just the claims and payroll today. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Adjourn the OCPPA. Convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, where we have three items. All right. Any comments or questions here on the EAT? Cast your votes then. And it passes unanimously. We'll adjourn the OCEAT and reconvene the council meeting with a consent docket. All right. We have a motion and a second. Are there any individual considerations? Hold on. What is a lengthy consent doc? Mayor. Mayor. Yeah, Pete. Uh, so I can find the numbers here. Uh, a, uh, AJ and um, AF. All right, Pete, go ahead and jump in with AJ. Uh, AJ is a uh, uh, red. Uh, it's the lease agreement with uh, uh, Riverfront Development Authority and uh, uh, to install and operate a temporary rail terminal at uh, Northeast 10th and Sooner. 
Um, the, I, I, there's been a lot of talk about the, uh, uh, like ra the rail between Oklahoma City and Tulsa, and this is really kind of the first, uh, they, they did a trial run last, uh, in the spring, and this is a, a more permanent arrangement. The, um, the concern is really, I think, on both ends of the, that line, and that is that we finally get, uh, we, we get to bring uh, the, it into Oklahoma City and, they get, and at the other end to bring it into Tulsa so that it can be a much more um, uh, convenient operation rather than having to bus, they have to bus from Sopulpa on the north end and we are on, the, are on the east end and we have to bus from 10th and Sooner to get people into Oklahoma City. It may work all right, but I think it's going to be a deterrent to a long-term um, uh, solution. And there are solutions out on, on this end uh, that could bring the, the train on into uh, at least a brick town. So it would, um, and I think we ought to be thinking about that and working on it. I think that's going on in Tulsa, and I'd just like to encourage um, the, the company that's bringing it in and, and, uh, and continue to encourage us to do something to try to make that a much more convenient operation. I think uh, the cars are, have been delivered. They're pretty attractive looking cars. And, and um, I just think it's something that we need to keep on the front burner to try to make it work. There's uh, gonna be two, from February through the end of next year, two trains a day moving on that line. As you right. say, it doesn't quite get to downtown Oklahoma City. It doesn't, right quite get to downtown Tulsa, so we have right. some work to do. I, yeah, if there is a way we can you know, work with the railroad and get involved and, and figure out a way to get that closer into the, to the Santa Fe hub, I think it, yeah. it, it really improved the experience. But as it is, there, there will be transportation on the end. You'll right. get onto a bus, right. which- Yeah, there'll be, and, on and both ends, there. people will be transported uh, by bus mm -hmm. to a more uh, central location in Tulsa and in, in uh, downtown Oklahoma City. I don't want to say, I don't want to, uh, sound like I'm being uh, uh, disparaging of the effort because it's a good idea. It's really a great idea, but it just could be much better if we could get those two end pieces working. So mm -hmm. that's just I, I just wanted to comment on it. The fact that the the pictures of the of the cars were uh, on the on the internet this week and it looked pretty good. It looks it's going to be an interesting operation. Mm -hmm. On the uh, on AF. Um, this is a resolution uh, approving an amended uh, budgetary allocation to um, uh, the completion of the Oklahoma City Community College Capitol Hill project. This, this is going to be a significant opportunity for both Capitol Hill and for the college. Uh, the, it's, um, I, I thought about this morning, I, I was watching uh, the news this morning and Langston's had a, a commercial and they have a, they run a commercial talk about how long they've been in Oklahoma City. And the very first picture on their commercial is a picture of, picture of Langston's on 25th Street where this facility is going to go. And it just reminded me again of how important that's going to be. I think it may be the, it's, it, it's, it, it's the next step in doing a, a renovation uh, to 25th Street. And I think it's, um, uh, hopefully it'll trigger a lot more better different kinds of, of uh, improvements to, to 25th Street because the architectural structures there are probably better than most of the areas that have already been revived. Uh, and it's just a really good project and I'm looking forward to seeing it move along. Yes, yeah, so this is a capital project, Jim. We're gonna be- Yes. Just kind of what, invest in the-, in the in, in their, in their construction, construction project for, the, for, the, for their new facility. And they're taking, uh, gosh, construction must have been done. Years and years in ago. In the 30s yeah. or 40s Decades or ago. 50s and, and try to re revitalize that area. We, we do have a significant delegation from Oklahoma City Community College right. here, 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 here today. Uh, Your well, Honor. It's, a, it's the, the education is one aspect of it, but just the investment in those older, you know, that old architecture is so badly needed. Right. There's, some, there's some great potential. All right. Uh, and I think this is, this is a, you know, an incredible investment that, that's being made. Yeah, David. Well, I'd just like to point out that the funds are coming from a TIF designed for downtown, and it just it goes to show how far reaching that those TIF dollars are able to uh, go, and this is going to have a tremendous impact on the Capitol Hill community. But more importantly, and I know any one of the gentlemen out there could speak better on this, this is gonna help facilitate the reach of Oklahoma City Community College well 
into the community. And just like the library system, Oklahoma City Community College really does change people's lives. It, <clears throat> in this instance, it'll help with people needing some greater assistance on just some basic education issues, as well as hopefully uh, being the doorway into higher education. Uh, but it is so important that whenever we can expend public funds to help improve our citizens' lives, that we really take uh, a serious look at that and try to do as much as we can to help elevate all of our citizens' uh, knowledge, uh, job skills. Uh, it just really does change people's mm -hmm. lives. And I appreciate Dr. Seacrest, uh, Jerry Stewart, and all the uh, people involved at Oklahoma City Community College, because they truly have uh, their students' best interest uh, in mind on every decision that they make. Yeah. yeah. Meg? Mayor, if I could, I was just going to take a minute to recognize Dr. Paul Seacrest. Paul has uh, announced his r retirement uh, in July of 15 after an illustrious career at Oklahoma City Community College, and we appreciate everything you've done. I think this campus on 25th Street will provide a tremendous legacy along with that beautiful performing arts theater that's activated almost every day, I think, Paul. And, the campus has really grown under your stewardship, and we very much appreciate everything you've done. Yeah, Paul claims to be 60 years old, but I, you look at him <laughs> I and you think that I. Birthday, so I, <laughs> I, I still think there's, there's some shenanigans going on there. I think he's <laughs> got to be at least 10 years younger. Yeah, John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I echo <clears> the same <throat> comments as Councilman White and also uh, Councilman Greenwell and also uh, Councilwoman uh, Sire uh, to add on uh, OK Triple C. Uh, has done something that I think uh, sets the tone uh, in our city and the work that they do in the underserved uh, communities uh, in our city, in my view, uh, is outstanding. <coughs> um, you take, for example, um, what they do with uh, Oklahoma City Public Schools, uh, that any graduating se senior who wishes to attend their college, they can attend free, which I do believe that's outstanding. I think the opportunities uh, that it will present for the Capitol Hill, Hill area and the Hispanic community uh, on the south side, I think will be outstanding. So again, thank you. Okay, Triple C. Now we need to in increase participation in that program. You're right. Yeah, Pete. Yeah, one, the one, one other comment is that with, <coughs> within a, about a block and a half of this facility, the, the, the TIF money that's going into the Capitol Hill Library, um, they're only about a block and a half apart, and they're really going to, I think, jumpstart what's going on. We're, we're, I'm, I have a meeting this afternoon with, uh, with the library folks and the school people from uh, Capitol Hill Elementary School, which has become uh, uh, an interesting relationship because uh, you can go to Capitol Hill Library about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and it's just a regular library, not very many people there. And then about 2.30 when the kids get out of school at Lee, I mean, at uh, Capitol Hill Elementary, you can't find a seat. And um, so that's, that's really going to work out. Both of those projects together are really going to make a difference on 25th Street, I can tell you. We're, look, we're all excited about it. Yeah. Mayor, I think it's important to point out on, on TIF 2 and, and, and TIF 8 and, and, and some of the others, we've set aside monies for the taxing agencies. And if you go back to the concept of, of TIF projects, you, you, these developments would not have happened without the TIF being in place. But for that TIF to be in place, the taxing agencies, the school district, the county, the city county health, the library system, and others had to give up part of their mill levy for a period of time to make that happen. And so some of that money is set aside for specific to incent specific development, but other of that money is put in, in, in specific uh, funds to help those taxing agencies on, on some specific projects within those areas. So it's really kind of a win-win as we go forward. Yeah, good reminder. Anybody else? Mayor, if I could pop uh -huh. back just for a quick second to AJ. I wanted to follow up on Pete's comments about the railroad. And manager, if, could we schedule a meeting? I think we've gotten the name of a couple of the contacts no, uh, with the railroad. And if you wouldn't mind scheduling a meeting we for were, us. We're happy to do that. We talked about that last week. And, so and, that we, and we, will, we will be doing that. And what the councilwoman is asking for is a meeting with, with the, uh, the, the people with Iowa Pacific who, who will be running this and, and to talk about what we can do to help and what their, what their intentions are to better understand the service. And I definitely would like to be included uh, in on that meeting. And also, I echo the comments from 
uh, Councilman White and also Councilwoman Sayu. All right. All right, ready to vote the consent docket? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And we're on to the concurrence docket. All right, any individual considerations here? Okay, cast your votes. Passed unanimously. On to item nine, these are items that require a separate vote. We'll start with a series of zoning cases. The first is in Ward 3 at 200 North McCormick Avenue. It's currently a simplified planned unit development and it would change to an I-3 heavy industrial district if approved. Larry? Yes, has anybody signed up on this? This is going back to the original zoning on this particular piece of property. It was uh, uh, done into a spud uh, about a year or so ago. Uh, that deal fell through and the owner has asked us to go back to I-3 zoning uh, with no objection and the Planning Commission approved it unanimously. I move for approval. All right. We're voting on item 9A1. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9A2 is a zoning case in Ward 5 at 812 Southwest 85th Street. It's currently 02 General Office District and it would change to R1. David, we have one person that has signed up. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, Ms. Reese, would you like to uh, join us up here and just give us a little bit of, of uh, explanation as yeah. What you're trying to achieve is to downzone this and be able to build a, a home. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, Peggy Reese, 812 Southwest 85th. Uh, we bought about two and a half acres of land 23 years ago. And there are three lots left. Um, the property was zoned 02 when we purchased it. But at that time, the city had a grandfather clause that would allow us to build our house and our garage. And uh, since then, <laughs> um, we still have our house, which is just the, on the right, on where it's boxed in. Um, we still own two acres of property. And as my husband and I get older, it's hard for us to mow it and keep it up. And uh, so we actually have two lots to the west. And we would like to get our house legal now because the grandfather clauses, as you know, were taken away a few years ago. And so uh, we actually have three lots there. Uh, the one that our house is on is still 02. And the other two lots are O2. And we want all three of those lots to be zoned R1. We do have a buyer for the two lots to the west. And uh, they're going to build a nice new home. And uh, so we were supposed to close this week. So we would hope that you would give us an emergency on that. Thank you. Uh, and this was approved unanimously by the Planning Commission. So I recommend. Uh, Approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A2. We have a motion and a second. Any other comments or questions from anyone? Well, we have to vote uh, on yes. that second. Yeah. Yes. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Okay, and I would recommend that we approve the emergency. Okay, cast your votes. Passes 9 0. Thank you. Item 9A3 is a zoning case in Ward 3 at 11903 Southwest 26th Street. It's currently an RMH1 manufactured mobile home subdivision district and a community unit plan overlay, and it would become an R1 single family residential district if approved. Larry? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, has anybody signed up on this? Uh, this was unanimously approved by the Planning Commission, uh, unless the applicant wants to say something. Uh, this is a uh, great project that will upgrade this area, and I move for approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A3. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. Item 9A4 is a zoning case in Ward 7 at 7501 East Hefner Road. It's currently AA Agricultural, and it would become an RA single-family, one-acre rural residential district. John? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Has anyone signed up? All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, this item um, was approved by Planning Commission. I recommend uh, for approval. I move for approval. All right, we're voting on item 9A5. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9A6 is a zoning case. 
Oh, you're right. That was item 9A4. Now to 9A5, which is also a zoning case in Ward 7, at 1400 East Memorial Road. It's currently R1 single family residential, and it would become a new plan unit development. John, we're back in Ward 7. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Madam Clerk, I understand we do have someone who has signed up. Can we hear from the uh, applicant first and then the person who have signed up? Okay. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Council. Chris Anderson with SMC Consulting Engineers representing the developer. Also have Mr. Dirk O'Hare and Mr. Kit Wakeley with the development company uh, that's doing this project. This is a PUD project uh, on East Memorial Road. It's approximately eight acres. Uh, sits a little east of Broadway Extension. It is for a post-recovery uh, care project with a rehabilitation building and also uh, related op uh, medical office buildings. It was approved on uh, September 25th unanimously by the Planning Commission. And with that, we'll be happy to entertain any questions. All right, thank you. Now, at Planning Commission, it uh, helped my memory. There were uh, protests at Planning Commission, and the concerns were worked out with those protesters. Yes, at the initial Planning Commission meeting, there were uh, protesters that showed up, and we uh, continued that meet meeting. Uh, had a neighborhood meeting uh, at, at the neighborhood with the uh, residents there. Worked out some issues. The main concern was a uh, wall uh, that separated the residential project from, from our project. Uh, we agreed to an eight-foot masonry wall and also a 15-foot landscape buffer along that area, and that uh, made the residents happy. Uh, we worked things out. So. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. we hear from? Yeah, well, Kit Wakeley. Oh, okay, you're part of the applicant. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I, I just want uh, to thank again the, uh, the applicant uh, for working uh, with the uh, surrounding neighborhoods. Um, again, thank you. I move for approval. All right, cast your votes. It passes unanimously. We're still in Ward 7 at 4225 Northeast 23rd Street. This zoning case is currently R1 single family residential and C3 community commercial, and it would become a new plan unit development if approved. John? All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. When this item uh, first came uh, to me, it was a year ago, and uh, originally the owner uh, wanted to turn the 50 acres into um, what I described as trash, trash, trash. Um, I do want to thank the, the applicant uh, for coming back with something uh, that uh, will definitely bring economic development into um, Ward uh, 7. Uh, so I do move for approval. All right. Are there any, anyone here hoping to speak on item 9A6 before we vote? All right. Cast your votes. And also, Mr. Hand. May, I, I want the emergency uh, on this. I move for the emergency. All right, cast your votes. Passes 9-0. Thank you. And once again in Ward 7 at 5709 Northeast 138th Street, it's currently CHC Highway Commercial District, and it would become a new simplified planning development. John? All right, thank you. Uh, this item was uh, approved by uh, Planning Commission, um, and the applicant has also asked for uh, the emergency. I move for approval. Okay. We have a motion and a second. I was just looking at the map here to see where that was. That's, is that on the other side of Edmond? Is that where that is? Yes. Okay. Just a, a couple hundred feet away from Edmond. On the other side of the service road is Edmond. Okay. All right. We're ready to vote on item 9A7. Yes. Okay. All right. Francis is pointing out the easement has been submitted. Well, I'm voting now. And it, Passes unanimously. Then I move for the emergency. Okay, cast your votes, and it passes 9-0. Item 9B is an ordinance that was recommended for denial at the Planning Commission. This is in Ward 5 at 16301 South Penn. David? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Johnson, would you like to make a presentation? Yes, please. Good morning, Tim Johnson with Johnson Associates on behalf of the applicant. Um, we, uh, this was denied, uh, recommended for denial by the Planning Commission. Uh, we have requested through the staff that the uh, C3 track be withdrawn from the application 
and we're going to come back with a PUD, uh, but we would request that the R1 portion be allowed to be approved. We have provided the uh, easements to the staff for that. Okay, thank you. And uh, my understanding in visiting with staff is that the reason uh, for the denial at the Planning Commission was focusing more on the commercial side and not necessarily on the residential side. Bob, could you provide any additional comments? That's correct. The, the Planning Commission was concerned about C3 at that location without a, without a PUD to regulate the uses. Yes, sir. Uh, the R1 zoning is consistent with the plan and the services are available. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, then, uh, based upon that information, I recommend approval of the R1 section of this uh, uh, development. We have a motion and a second to approve item 9B. Cast your votes. It passes 9-0. Thank you. Item 9C is a, a utility easement closure request, and it's uh, in Ward 8 at MacArthur and 164th Street. Pat, you okay with this? All right, we're voting on item 9C. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. And then item... 9C2 has been continued until December 2nd. Item 9C3 uh, would close a utility easement in Ward 3 at 9001 Southwest 38th Street. Larry? Yes, this is to close a utility easement. Uh, there were no protests at the uh, Planning Commission. Anybody sign up to protest? Uh, this is to allow a house that was built on the easement to uh, become legal. Uh, I move for approval. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9D is uh, to us for a, a final hearing. This is, uh, council's been approached uh, by this and we've introduced it previously. It has to do with utility theft. All right, we're voting on item 9D. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And item 9E is also to us for a, a final time. And this would remove a couple of parking spaces on Colcord Drive. All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9F is an item that's being introduced today. Uh, it has to do with our, our mechanical code. And David right. Acock is here. David Adcock is here, and uh, item, item 9F and 9G are updates to uh, F is the mechanical systems code, and, and uh, G is the plumbing code. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name's David Adcock. Um, we're here this morning to uh, introduce three construction codes, in particular, uh, to, in relating to commercial buildings. Uh, model codes are published by the International Code Council. They're, in a, they're published in a three-year cycle and they're the basis for the minimum construction standards of the state of Oklahoma. The electrical code is published separately by National Fire Protection Association, and they're one year prior to the ICC codes. Uh, currently, the state recognizes the 2009 editions of uh, the International Building Code, International Plumbing Code, International Mechanical Code, and the International Fire Code. And uh, currently, the city has adopted uh, the 2009 International Building Code, the 2000 International Plumbing Code, the 1996 International Mechanical Code, and the 2008 National Electrical Code. The Oklahoma City Plumbing and Mechanical Code Commissions have reviewed and recommend for adoption the 2009 editions of the International Plumbing Code, International Mechanical Code, and International Fire, uh, Fuel Gas Code. And that will align the city with Oklahoma City uh, to the minimum standards as adopted by the state. Many of the proposed changes that, that we have were made uh, for the purpose of reorganization, or re reorganizing our uh, city ordinances so that uh, all the building related ordinance that the titles and numbering will parallel each other. The Oklahoma City, one of the changes here is the Oklahoma City boiler licensing requirements have been modified to accept the Oklahoma State boiler licensing eliminating the need to provide boiler operator and contractor examinations that we do now. Also, there's new code language that requires locking type tamper resistant caps on refrigerant access ports. 
this is an effort to eliminate accessing the refrigerant for the purpose of inhalant abuse, which has become a problem. Uh, following the adoption of these codes, our plan is to stay more current with codes as they are adopted at the state level. Uh, the Oklahoma City Electrical Code Commission is beginning the review now of the 2014 Electrical Code, and we expect the 2015 edition of the ICC codes, as, as listed previously, to be adopted by the state uh, late next year, and the separate Oklahoma City Code Commissions will begin reviewing those 2015 codes for adoption. Uh, is there any questions or anything you have about the codes? He's asking for questions on the mechanical code that's being introduced today. I did, you, you yeah. kind of hit on there that of making it, staying more current. Yes. Is, what is the reason why we're just now adopting the, the 2009? I can't answer to, to a certain yeah. distance back, but re more recently, we've been working on these for probably the last two years. and. Uh, We've been meeting, one of the things that we've started in the development center is meeting with our contractors organizations. Now we have two meetings a year that are scheduled with each one of those organizations. We started this in September 2013. Let them know what is coming in these code adoptions. Uh, makes it easier for them and for us to, to uh, uh, regulate those codes. Um, but uh, then we have code commissions that actually review those codes. And the state actually, uh, when was that? I think 2011 started the Uniform, Oklahoma Uniform Building Code Commission, and they are, now they are reviewing the codes at the state level. So, and they have become, since then, they have become the minimum building standards for the state. So we have to kind of see what the state's doing for those minimum standards for our code commissions then to review them. Now, you know, that's, that's speaking to most recently. Uh, further back, I can't answer that, but I will say that, that uh, our plan is to have our code commissions up with the, the review of the new codes more in line with the state that, that will be adopting them as they come out. Okay. David, I think you answered my question, but we have two different sets of folks that review these for us. We have a commission for each one of the trades, essentially, but you also are getting citizen input via yes. the contractors and the mechanical folks. Yes, we do. We have open meetings with our contractors. Like I said, uh, we started this in September 2013. We have three a month in September and three a month in uh, March. And uh, we meet with those separate uh, contracting organizations, depending on what trade it is. So we have a, a night designated for each trade. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A quick question. On the um, changes in the code, will they impact cost doing business? Very little in this code cycle change. Um, the, the, like these, uh, one of the things I mentioned was the locking caps on refrigerant lines. I mean, we're talking 5 to $15. You know, it's, it's, they're so minimal that uh, uh, it was really hard to quantify any real cost. Thank you. All right. How about uh, a motion then on item 9F, item being introduced today? All right. Cast your votes. Passed unanimously. And there'll be a public hearing on December 2nd, and council is set for final adoption on December 16th. Uh, and next up, the plumbing code. Or was that both? That was both, but we need okay. separate motions. Yeah, we do need another. Okay, then I need a motion on item 9G. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And that is also set for public hearing on December 2nd with final adoption scheduled for December 16th. All right, 9H is a public hearing regarding dilapidated structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9H? All right, cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9I is a public hearing regarding a dilapidated structure in the Historic Preservation District. And um, there was a, a lot of comments from the HP Commission. Ed, do you have any comments on this? Is Ed Ward to speak? No. I'd, I'd move forward, move for approval. All right. We're voting on item 9I. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9J is a public hearing regarding unsecured structures. Is there anyone here hoping to speak or any item listed under 9J? All right, how about a motion? Yeah. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. <clears throat> item 9K is a resolution that would rename Ross Park into Belle Isle Park. And this is in Ward 2. Ed? Did you want to speak? And Doug Cupper is here. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, City Council, Doug Cuffer. The uh, Belle Isle neighborhood, uh, the, the, there's three neighborhoods over there that surround Ross Park. They've done a lot of work in that park. They, uh, they have adopted it. They do a lot of maintenance. They've planted trees and things along those lines. Uh, they came to the Board of Park Commissioners recommending that the uh, Ross Park be renamed in more in line with the community that they live in. And uh, the uh, Board of Park Commissioners have recommended that the name of the Ross Park be changed to Belle Isle Park. Uh, the research showed that Ross Park was named for a street in days of old, there is no person associated with this, so it's in keeping with the uh, ordinances that relates to renaming parks. I move for approval. Thank you. All right, we're voting on item 9K. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. 9L is also a resolution uh, to name a new sports complex that people have no doubt seen under construction over at Woodson Park for quite some time. And the new name would be the Wendell Wisenhunt Sports Complex in honor of former Oklahoma City Parks and Recreation Director Wendell Wisenhunt. And I notice Wendell's in the room. Probably with mixed emotions about this, uh, this vote that's coming up here. Any uh, comments from council before we vote? I, I will just say that, um, you know, the, the city has a, 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 you know, significant history about honoring our former parks commissioners. Uh, with some sort of, of presence in the city. Uh, you have to go to Pat Murphy, um, Alvin Egling, uh, and I'm probably missing a, a handful more, but uh, I think you know, those of us on the horseshoe know how important Wendell's uh, input has been here through good times and bad times and through good budget years and bad budget years. I thought Wendell did an incredible job of uh, keeping us afloat in bad times and then really investing wisely uh, when the proceeds were there. And uh, the city's gonna be better off from here on because of Wendell's work, and I think it's very appropriate, and I would urge the council to vote for it. All right, we're voting on item 9L. Cast your votes. It passes unanimously. Wendell, want to come? Yeah. Wendell, you want to come up? Invite us to your park. <laughs> I, just, I just want to say that uh, it was my greatest pleasure to be a part of, of growing the park system in Oklahoma City. Um, it's, it was an opportunity that, that I relished, I really did, Council Prefield, really relished that opportunity. And I also want to let you know that it was a great thing working with the city staff, uh, with the Parks and Recreation staff, but with the staff of the entire city uh, to make these things happen. I never got any, anything but cooperation from the entire staff, and uh, that was a great thing to remember. Um, there's really no higher honor, no greater honor for a Parks and Recreation Director than to have a facility that he or she had an impact on, on building, um, and so I've, I very much do appreciate the, the Board of Park Commissioner's recommendation and, and the Council's vote very much, very much. Thank you. Well, and, and like a lot of cities, we have been struggling to build enough soccer fields, and, uh, and this park complex is going to take a big step toward addressing the need. It's, it's perfectly placed uh, for great usage, uh, lots of soccer fields, and um, we need to continue to do that, of course. It would really help, um, but uh, soccer continues to grow, and we'll need more fields. When does the Wendell Wizen Hunt Sports Complex open? This, this spring. All right. Spring. And I urge people to, to sign up and participate. It's going to be yes, great. Sir. Can't wait to be there. Thank All you right. very Wendell, much. Wendell, congratulations, and Thank thanks you. for your service. All right, item 9M. I understand we do not need executive session, so just look for a resolution to pass it. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Likewise, on item 9N, I understand we do not need executive session, and just look for a resolution, a motion to pass the resolution. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. And once again, item 9.0, I understand we do not need executive session, we just look for a, a motion to pass the resolution. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. Item 9P, I understand we do need executive session, so why don't we have a motion to move item 9P into executive session when appropriate. Cast your votes, and that item moves to executive session. And then item 9Q, I understand we do not need executive session, so how about a motion to strike? Yes. Okay, move to strike. And on item 9Q, cast your votes. That item is struck from the agenda. And same with R, a motion to strike would be appropriate. Cast your votes. It passed unanimously. 
Item 9S is claims recommended for denial. Is there anyone here hoping to speak under any item listed under 9S? All right, how about a motion? Second. Cast your votes and those claims are denied. And then item 10 is claims recommended for approval. Did anyone come down to speak about any item listed under claims recommended for approval? All right, how about a motion then to approve those claim payments? Cast your votes, it passed unanimously. Then item 11 is items from council. And um, we'll start with uh, Councilman Swite's uh, request on behalf of several other council people and myself uh, to uh, move to the same schedule next year that we've had this year about scheduling council meetings. Pete, anything you want to say about this? Uh, we vote this time, it, it uh, moves into the books. Last time we just introduced it. Right. Yes, I just move approval. I think the council's in support of it. Mo the majority is, at least. All right, is there a motion? All right, cast your votes, and it passes unanimously. Let, let me ask, add one thing. Next year, when this comes up, can this be added to the, yes. um, so we don't have to do it twice? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, items from council. James, you have anything? Ed, Larry? Yeah, I'd just like to thank the residents of Fawn Valley, which is a, a neighborhood south of Mustang and west of uh, Mustang Road for their neighborhood meeting last night. And it was very gratifying the enthusiasm that these folks had in far southwestern Oklahoma City uh, for the MAPS projects and the uh, hmm. progress that had been made there. So, uh, What is the density south of Mustang? Very, very sparse. Okay. To, to when non you said neighborhood meeting, it made, it made me wonder if there were some developments that I've there are, there aware are, of. There are three developments, uh, primarily in the Fawn Valley area, one, two, and three. Uh, and uh, that's the major development south of Mustang right there. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Sure, Pete. Nothing. All right, David, Meg, John, Pat. Your, your microphone. Yeah, uh -huh. Quick request, city manager, remind people once again, they're driving a vehicle that's identified as city of Oklahoma City vehicle, regardless of what kind it is. They need to adhere to the traffic, religiously adhere to traffic, warning sign, instruction. Because to a lot of people, that's the only impression they have of Oklahoma. They see our people violating the law, it sort of creates an atmosphere of respect for the law. Okay. Couldn't agree more. We've sent out reminders to drivers. I'd be happy to do so again. We should probably also take note of, uh, of the temporary closing of, on Shields. You want to explain what's going on there and, and how long it'll be that way? Sure. Um, Shields is, is, was shut down yesterday to accommodate uh, the construction reconstruction or the construction of, of the bridge over the boulevard uh, uh, that uh, so the road has to be closed for a period of time for re utility relocations and for the construction of the bridge it was closed Monday and it'll be closed uh, toward to the end of, of 15 so it's gonna be closed for, for quite a while um, and so what we're doing is actually it, it's, a, it's a major construction project there's got to be a shoe fly around and, and, and actually have the construction of the uh, of that bridge to accommodate, uh, to accommodate the roadway through there. Mm -hmm. And we'll be going underneath that's correct. the railroad track and that's, that's the construction on Shields. Okay, well people will get used to it I guess after a while. Seems like a long time. Um, city manager reports, uh, presentation on downtown in December. Jane Jenkins is here this morning. Good morning, Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm here to give you an update on what's gonna be happening in downtown Oklahoma City for the holidays. Um, downtown in December, as you know, is a collection of events and attractions that runs basically through November, from no November 14th to January the 4th. And um, we market it under the umbrella of downtown in December. About three years ago, Devin came in as a presenting sponsor and we were really able with, with that help to do a lot more. The first thing, of course, is the Devon Ice Rink, now in a permanent location in the Myriad Gardens. It's its fourth season there. It's open seven days a week. You can get a full schedule at downtownindecember.com, and the rates are $12 a person for all ages and will include your skates, or you can skate for $8 if you bring your own skates. Another big event is Devon Saturdays with Santa. This is something that has really blown to uh, gargantuan proportions from when we started it. And it's just a fabulous event for families. 
Santa comes to the rotunda at Devon Energy every Saturday, November 29th, from December 20th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. You can write letters to the, well, your children, I suppose you can too. Write letters to the North Pole, create holiday crafts, and enjoy holiday musical entertainment. And then uh, something that we instigated last year and seemed to work fairly well, we're working the bugs out, is that you can register when you arrive at downtown in December, at, at Saturdays with Santa, and then you can enjoy all of the activities and they will text you when it's time for you to come up and meet Santa. Because we were having such long lines for people to standing in line to meet Santa. So this way everyone can enjoy everything. This event has gotten so large that we are actually closing Sheridan the Saturdays during Saturdays with Santa. And there will be a um, little train that will be taking you between Devon and the Marriott Gardens and just another added attraction so it won't seem like you have to wait so long to visit with Santa Claus. So it's gonna be uh, really great this year. Uh, another big event is the Chesapeake Snow Tubing, once again at the uh, Chickasaw Bricktown Ballpark. Uh, this year we're doing things a little bit differently. It will actually open to the public December 13th uh, after kids are out of school will, all, will be when all of our public sessions are. And again, $12 will get you an hour and a half of snow tubing, just like it's been in the past. Uh, you can purchase tickets at the ballpark ticket office or again uh, at downtownindecember.com, which is where we have all our information about downtown in December. Another favorite Christmas tradition is the Sandridge Tree Lighting Festival. It's always the Friday after Thanksgiving from 5 to 7 p.m. It will be live music, food, and fun Christmas tree will be lit by Mayor Cornette. Um, we will have cookies from Nona's, popcorn from Harkins, and Katie Bug's uh, hot cocoa food truck will be there. Santa will be at the festivities to greet everyone. And it's just really become a fun event. We've moved the tree over to the plaza on the ballpark side of Mickey Mantle, which gives everybody an opportunity to gather around the tree and it just feels really, really close. Um, another favorite event is the Sandridge Santa Run, and this year it will be Saturday, December 13th at 9 a.m. at Leadership Square. It's a 5K race, a one-mile fun run, and a kid's dash. Uh, there's lots of indoor activities for children, Spaghetti Eddie, Coloring Station. Again, you can register at downtownindecember.com. And the thing that's really fun about this run is that there's a costume contest with cash prizes for the registered 5K runners. So it's always fun to see what creative costumes will show up at Leadership Square. Even if you're not running, it's a fun morning to be downtown at nine o'clock and uh, have coffee and watch all the costumes. Again, we're doing free holiday boat rides at the Water Taxi. Um, one Main Financial, once again, sponsored the lights on the Bricktown Canal, and they did some extra stuff this year, and it looks so beautiful. And the free boat rides will be Thursday through Sunday evenings, November 28th through December 28th, from 6 until 9.30 p.m. We will be closed Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day, and this year we're gonna load the boats just west of Oklahoma Avenue beneath, uh, kind of under Zio's, is where the loading will be for the free, um, the free water taxi rides, but this is always a very popular event. They fill the boats up on almost every single, um, every single trip, and it, it seems to do well regardless of weather. Even if it's cold, people seem to like riding the canal boats and seeing the lights. And speaking of lights, another holiday favorite is the Automobile Alley Lights on Broadway. This is where we put lights and curtains, curtain type lights on the buildings on Broadway and really with the neon signs that are there, it creates a really magical effect. And, uh, and again, people um, w really like to, to, to see this. This year, in fact, it's this week, we have uh, Shop Hop, which will be our kind of kickoff to shopping on Automobile Alley. We've uh, really increased the retail on Broadway in the past year. And so we're trying to encourage people to do more shopping and the lights will help that. Deluxe Winter Market, which went under the Downtown in December umbrella last year, uh, was at the um, Chevy, Chevy Event Center in Bricktown last year. But this year, it's moving to Leadership Square, and I think this is so exciting. It's Saturday and Sunday, November 29th and 30th from 10 to 6, and you'll have more than 60 vendors featuring crafts, a lot of made-in-Oklahoma items, 
Um, this is one of the holiday's best shopping events, and we're so excited to have it in the center of downtown this year and in a new and exciting venue. And then another thing with Sonic Segway Santa. Sonic sponsors Santa on a Segway rolling around downtown. Uh, Santa will have giveaways, including Sonic um, gift cards. And this year, we're going to have a few Santa is coming to Oklahoma books for kids that some lucky children will receive uh, from Segway Santa. And again, uh, you can follow Downtown OKC on Twitter to discover where Sonic, uh, Seg Sonic Segway Santa will be. We're t we'll try to track him, and so people can, uh, can try to find him, too. He'll be at all the events. Uh, an event we started three years ago, Continental Free Movie Mondays. Uh, this has just been a phenomenally popular event. It's at Harkins Theater in Bricktown. We show a Christmas movie every Monday during the holiday season. Monday, December 8th at 7 p.m., the, the movie is Elf. You have to register online at downtownanddecember.com starting December 25th for that movie, and then every week it's a week out, and we sell out of these free tickets every single time. So Continental is happy, Harkins is happy, and again, it's a great family way to see some Christmas movies, some of your favorite Christmas movies on the big screen in Bricktown. An event that we added last year is Little Willie's Triple Dog Dare. It's a stair climbing event. Um, I'll challenge anyone to, I, I will really respect you if you do this. You uh, climb flights of stairs at Leadership Square, which is 22 floors, Oklahoma Tower, which is 31 floors, and then the Leadership Square South Tower is 16 floors, thus the triple dog dare. You can do one, two, or all three of those stair climbing events, and this will be Saturday, December 6th. And again, this is a great thing to see downtown, to watch these athletes doing this stair climbing down, downtown, um, something that was brought to us by our friend uh, Mark Beffert, so we, we really have enjoyed that one. Santa's Adventures on the Oklahoma River, of course, the We've talked a lot about the river uh, today at this council meeting, but the holidays at the Boathouse District will begin November 28th through January 4th. There is the North Pole Climb, the Sandridge Santa Zip, Rumble Drop, Snow Bounce, Candy Cane Rock Wall, Rudolph's Launch, and more. And again, it can be uh, at least with a pass to the, to the river, the river district, a $35 all-day pass for all ages to experience the fun on um, on the river during the holidays. And another shopping event, because shopping is so important to our city during this time of year, are the holiday pop-up shops. They will begin Thursday, November 28th through the December 21st. This year, they're located in Midtown at 10th and Hudson, next to the Blue Garden um, Food Truck Park. There will be 38 rotating shops, plus an urban Christmas tree lot. Now this, to get information, you can go to okcpopups.com. What I really love about this event is every weekend the vendors change. So you need to go to this event every weekend if you want to catch all of the opportunities. They're all local businesses. Some of them have bricks and mortar stores in Oklahoma City. Some of them are only pop-ups. But it's a great way to do some uh, Christmas shopping by your Christmas tree. And the igloos really do... Um, really do give the impact of the, of the holiday season, and it'll be very visible this year, I think, at 10th and, um, 10th and Hudson. Uh, there are other downtown in December events. First of all, the winter shops will also be back at the Myriad Gardens this year. Those are the little chalets, similar to what you might see in Bryant Park in New York, that are managed by Prodigal. And along with that, Prodigal has added a carousel so you can ride the carousel for a dollar and shop at these shops. This is great for Saturdays with Santa because we have so many people down there. And again, you register for Saturdays with Santa, and then you can go do all kinds of other things, and there's just more for you to do downtown until you get a text telling you it's time to go see Santa. We will have a film row holiday party on December 17th. Of course, the Nutcracker is a Christmas tradition for many Oklahoma City families. The Christmas show with the Philharmonic is also a Christmas tradition. Lyric has a Christmas carol. Opening night will be December 31st. And then the, there's hockey games, and the Skirvin is also hosting some holiday events this year. So you can get all the information that you ever wanted to get uh, at our website at downtownindecember.com. 
Of course, I'm always available if you want to email me if you have any specific questions or if there's anything that I can help to make your holiday experience in downtown Oklahoma City better. We really appreciate all your support. This is the biggest thing that we do all year and it's always a lot of fun. So thank you. We appreciate you and your staff. Jane, any comments or questions from council? Just that it's stunning. I mean, um, I think back to a couple of years ago um, as we got started with this, the idea uh, you know, was really just to knit together a couple of the things that were already happening in downtown. And Jane, your staff has taken it to such a, another level by creating all these events, bringing in downtown sponsors. Um, I just, I can't imagine that anybody would come down and not be able to find just tons of things to do with well, their families. Thank you, and I just want to note that the Downtown in December umbrella encompasses a lot of things, like I said, with the Nutcracker and the Phil, things that we don't actually produce, but we promote under our marketing brand so that we try to, to give the idea that there's so much every holiday event in downtown over the course of from Thanksgiving to New Year's is there. The Myriad Gardens, of course, does a lot of their own programming, but we're happy to promote all of the activities and things that they're doing there as part of our downtown in December. You did remind me that um, if at the Devon um, skating rink, if you're a member of the Myriad Gardens, I think the cost is only eight dollars rather than twelve. So oh, great. encourage people to join the Myriad Gardens. And you don't Gardens, have to bring your own skates. And you don't have to bring your own skates. <laughs> yes. It's a good time to join the Myriad Gardens Foundation. All right. Jane, thank you. Thank you. Next up. Next up is a report on the, on the uh, lethality uh, assessment protocol for domestic violence. And, and uh, Chief Johnny Coleman's here. Good morning. Uh, this morning, I'd like to introduce Captain Kim Flowers. Uh, she's going to make the presentation. She supervises the robbery and domestic violence units. And she's been involved in this uh, uh, study since the very beginning and has spearheaded our efforts on behalf of the police department. So, um. Good morning. How are you all doing this morning? I'm very honored to be here to share with you uh, the adventures that we've had for the last five years on the Oklahoma Lethality Protocol Assessment, or that we refer to as OKLAP, a police advocate collaborative response to domestic violence. Uh, our study began in 2019, uh, I'm sorry, February 19th of 2009. That was phase one of the comparison phase where our officers uh, received lethality training and encouraged our victims to participate in the DV uh, research study. Uh, that study lasted a little bit longer than the researchers thought it would because uh, it took a while to make sure the contact in the victims was difficult. So it, it extended the study much longer than they thought it would happen. Uh, phase two, uh, 19 months later, was the treatment phase. <coughs> Uh, the officers received online training on uh, how to conduct the LAP for uh, decreasing domestic violence and also use the hotline when appropriate. Once the study was complete in 2013, the findings, uh, we found that we completed uh, 3,133 lethality assessments. 80% were from Oklahoma City Police Department because we had six others uh, law enforcement agencies in the state who also participated. 1,566 hotline calls uh, resulting from the study, and that would be the why. Uh, Oklahoma City Police Department recognized the importance of the LAP and continued involvement in the program after the study was completed and implemented procedures and made the uh, assessment mandatory. Uh, the Oklahoma lethality uh, assessment protocol basically consists of when an officer responds to an intimate partner uh, relation domestic call, he will offer the uh, lethality assessment to the victim. If she requests, if she uh, will participate in the study, if she's willing to participate in the study, the officer will then complete the screening. And if she would like to talk to the Y after it's over, she can do so. Uh, a lot of times on the assessment, it scores their level of threat from high to medium to low. And uh, normally, I believe, on every assessment in this study, the, the victim scored at high risk. Uh, so, you know, we have a definite problem in our state, and that's why we participated in this. Um, again, once the, the form is completed, the officer asks the victim if she'd like to talk to the advocate on the hotline. If she does, the officer will then make the telephone call and advise the advocate how the victim scored 
and what her score was and some of the responses she might have made, of with, made when, when he uh, asked the questions. And then the victim would get on the phone and do safety planning. And this is right at the scene of a domestic and do immediate safety planning with her at that, at that point instead of waiting for a day or two later. Um, during the last year legislative session, Oklahoma City uh, Representative Kay Floyd uh, learned of the LAP risk as assessments through our uh, Oklahoma City uh, LAP and solicited our help in developing legislation statewide to require all officers in the state of Oklahoma to complete the LAP. Uh, this amended the Victims' Rights Bill for police officers to, allow, to ask 11 lethality assessment questions at the scene of a domestic violence call. Uh, collaboration, or collaboration and advocate agencies, or call them, I'm sorry, when appropriate. Uh, this went in effect on November 1st, 2004, 14, and Oklahoma is the first in the U.S. to legislate domestic violence LAP. Uh, CBS News coverage highlighted the Oklahoma City LAP uh, process by riding with Officer Brandy May at Will Rogers uh, as she responded to domestic violence calls in Oklahoma City. Uh, the segment was shown nationally on October 31st uh, of this year, and I'd like to share that with you right now. In, in Brandy's credit, she, the photographer that rode with her, um, it took six days to get coverage on this, so she was very <laughs> um, patient. Investors today are looking for opportunities. market. One of the themes I like is Japan. It's one of the cheapest markets in the developed world to invest in. In the earnings of the companies. Yeah, commercial from BlackRock in the middle of mm -hmm. way. I happen to see this story here on CBS News. Did you see night. it? Yeah, it was, so, as you'll see it, 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 I think it really shows us in a good light to take on a tough issue. Very positive. Mm -hmm. have been having positive surprises. iShares has a Japan fund. The ticker's EWJ. It gives you broad access to large and mid-sized companies. Within Japan. Call 1-800-iShares to request a prospectus, which includes investment objectives, risks, fees, expenses, <laughs> and other information that you should read and consider carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including cost <coughs> heard about a new police strategy for fighting domestic violence, we wanted to know more, especially when we found out that in Maryland, fatalities have dropped by 30 percent when they started using it. The strategy requires nothing more than a pencil and paper. Here's Anna Werner. Oklahoma City Police Officer Brandy May answers domestic violence calls like this one nearly every day. I want to ask you some questions so you can answer yes, no, or you can choose not to answer at all, okay? But now she has a new tool. One police hearsay is simple but effective. It's a checklist of 16 questions. Does Shane have an alcohol or substance abuse yes. problem? Designed to help officers identify victims who are likely to be killed. Do you think that Shane might try to kill you? After the night, probably. The more times a victim answers yes, the more likely domestic violence may lead to her death. If he said he was going to kill me, he says it every time, but 
I just thought it was an empty threat, and tonight it made me believe that he would. So in four years, you've seen eight women killed. Mm -hmm. Captain Kim Flowers heads the domestic violence unit, which has been using the checklist for three years. A lot of them cry and uh, say, oh my God, I can't, I can't believe I'm, I'm letting this happen. So they start to process it mm -hmm. through the checklist. Right, exactly. The questions were developed by a researcher at Johns Hopkins University. For example, number five, has he ever tried to choke you? Research found men who choked their partners were 10 times more likely to eventually kill them. He wants you to know that he's in control and he can snap your neck in half whenever he feels like it. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna call the hotline. Officer May found this woman was in serious danger. Do you just wanna speak with him or would you like to seek shelter? So she took the next step in the new protocol by putting her on the phone with the domestic yes. violence hotline right there at the scene. It offers them support, it makes them feel stronger, it gives them the opportunity to take back a hold of their life. This victim told us it made a difference for her. I didn't know, you know what I mean? I just thought this was normal. And it's not, it's not normal, and it's not okay. Statewide use of the checklist starts Saturday in Oklahoma. 16 questions that might save lives. Anna Werner, CBS News, Oklahoma City. One thing I would like to share, um, the one victim that we heard on the video just a minute ago, uh, if you could notice in her voice, she was choked. And uh, the two cases that the uh, photojournalist from CBS that rode with uh, Brandy, um, both victims sought shelter after they uh, used the telephone that evening. So it's a great tool. Um, we've been partnering with the uh, Attorney General's office, um, providing training throughout the state right now for the other smaller agencies who do not have resources. So anyway, that's all I have, unless you all have any questions. Well. Kim, what can we do? Is there anything the council and I can do to, to, to continue to support this program or a next step you'd like to see us go? Well, we're really working hard. Um, I think collaborating with uh, our uh, advocates in the state and um, like I said, we've been number three for the last two years in uh, homicides with intimate partner domestics and we're really trying very hard to get the education out there and the word that there is help and by the immediacy of providing this assistance on a call, I think is, is huge. As a matter of fact, we've, we have been bombarded with requests. As a matter of fact, I got a call from a chief in uh, South Carolina. He said, you know what, we're number second on the list. Can you send us whatever you have? So, you know, it's a, a national problem. And I think as a city, we're working really hard to uh, address it with all our partners. Are there funding gaps that you see in the in the different layers? This, this obviously is a very complicated layered approach. Well, domestic violence is a very difficult crime to attack, you know, with all the different uh, aspects of it. But, you know, we're working really hard with why, and I don't know, Chief, do, what do you think? Well, right now we're in fairly good shape because we've implemented these programs and, and we have made it a priority, and I think that's the key is to make domestic violence a priority. You've got to start there, mm -hmm. and then once you do there and start devoting the resources, uh, that's what you got to do to start impacting the problem. Are, are we spending adequate time in the recruitment process in, in training the next generation of police officers to be more sensitive to domestic violence? Absolutely, issues? and it's, it's evolved over the years since we've all started, but right now they're receiving all this training right now in the academy, so they'll be armed with this when they hit the streets. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful program, and it's just a tragedy that this is another one of the lists where Oklahoma rises to the top. Um, but I so appreciate the collaboration with the Y. Um, they're doing such great work um, at their shelter. Where they're just about to do the ribbon cutting uh, for the second um, housing facility. I mean, the shelter at the Y is at 102% capacity 100% of the time, I think, and um, we just don't have enough um, places for people to, to seek shelter. We know how hard it is for women to be courageous enough. And, and I think I want to say men too. Uh, women mm -hmm. aren't the only folks that are sometimes. I think there are 5%. 5% of the men, there were 5% of the men in the study, 95% were women. So there just isn't enough access to safe places for them to go. And 
I think the numbers, Kim, you can correct me, but it takes seven times for a woman to yes, typically be brave enough to mm -hmm. finally leave a, a violent situation. And there, there is a, uh, uh, Christy Mitchell from the Y has a, a, a video of a victim who said if it wasn't for that officer who returned to her house several times and believed in her, that uh, she wouldn't have left and uh, she probably would have, she probably wouldn't be with us right now. So they're finding though through this study they found that 95 percent of the victims that they spoke to have been strangled. So that's kind of the new uh, thing I guess you would call where men who have uh, become very uh, acute at domestic violence are strangling women without leaving any marks or injuries on, around their neck and it, it can be deadly without seeking medical treatment. So we're, we're working really hard with the officers in identifying that too. Thank you for your great work. Can just, thanks question, for your work. Yeah, just a question, what, what percent of the homicides would, would substance abuse be involved or addiction? We have that as one of our questions. It's not one of the 11 that are state mandated, but on our assessment, we have that listed that um, if there is alcohol or drugs involved and what kind. But I think we find probably a high percentage of our calls are alcohol related with sure. domestic violence. So is, it seems that maybe a, a way to indirectly, I mean, when, for the council maybe is, is to give support to substance abuse services and we, some time to time we have zoning issues. And that, that to me seems to be highly, highly correlated is substance abuse and addiction issues. The, med the medical field's really looking at this study also as far as when you have uh, victims who come into the ER uh, who are injured and who do not want to um, call the police. So they're looking at that pretty hard too, so. Great, thanks. All right, yeah, Pete. I, I, um, I, I think I, I, we need to uh, compliment uh, Senator Floyd also for taking the ball running with it it's not we as I, I, some of you have probably heard me complain about the lack of uh, support that we receive from the legislature on a number of issues but this is an issue where somebody took the problem and really got after it and, and, and we owe her a bit of gratitude for that also because that that doesn't happen nearly often enough and I think we need to point it out when it does happen when we have a legislator that really takes a takes a I know the researchers were a little shocked. They didn't think they'd move quite that fast, but. <laughs> right. no. it, I, just, I just don't think we ought to let it go without complimenting her on doing it. She's great. She was awesome to work with. Great. All right, Kim, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Johnny. Thank you. That's it. All right. Citizens to be heard. Now's your chance. All right. We have executive session. We'll be back.